so great to meet you. <laughs> so uh, recently, I saw you a lot. No, not a lot. I saw you. I saw you work in Florence because I went oh. there for Donatello, and you were you were almost there. <laughs> and uh, I saw that you are going to occupy the big space in Saint Pompidou Mess. Yes, super excited, super excited. Yeah, so probably it's the first time that we, you will be the guest star in such a museum, right? Yeah, I'm deeply honored, deeply honored. And so I will... I'm so excited like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to know, I wanted to know what you are going to propose there. Yeah, so I'm a media artist working with data. Um, now almost 14 years, by the way. Uh, ah, I started ah. my journey 2008 when I was studying in Istanbul, where I'm originally from. And in my undergrad, the last year of my undergrad studies, there was an amazing class given by a professor from Aalto University from Helsinki. And he was teaching an amazing class of teaching the creators how to use programming language. This is like a kind of very cutting edge software. You can create anything you wish. Um, there, I think I coined the term data painting. So since then, I never stopped thinking about data. And 2011 did my first data sculpture, a large piece using sound data. And 2016, six years ago, I became the first generation AI artist in residence at Google, which is very important because before that time, artists were not able to use algorithms to create art with AI. Mm. So I'm so lucky that I'm one of those first in, generation. In what year was it? 2016, February. Well, wow, very early on. Yeah, I, I think that's why I'm happy to say I'm a pioneer in the aesthetics of AI um, because after that, maybe two, three years later, the medium became exciting and more relevant. But to me, what is amazing is the first, first years, right? Um, but also six years is like a 60 years in, <laughs> in when you work with AI. Yeah, it's so going fast. very fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm very honored to be in Pompidou Mets because the I, also I coined the term AI data painting and AI data sculptures, which is an, an Im imagination with machine and human that create art. So over the six years, um, I work with more than 2 billion images and train more than 100 AI models. So I am giving too many numbers. I'm sorry, but I work with data. So numbers are really <laughs> too much important. But then I learned something very inspiring. The idea of using memory, memory of humanity. For example, nature. I'm obsessed with nature. I love water. I love light. I love everything about nature. Even though I'm a digital artist, I love physical world, by the way. <laughs> like I'm not this, you know, everything digital, everything. I love physical world. And then this project I'm showing in, in, in METS is called Machine Hallucinations, Nature Dreams. So the project explores 300 million images of nature. So this is kind of 2019, 20, just before the pandemic. This was the idea of happening in my mind. During the pandemic, I think we all stuck in our homes. Unfortunately, some of us affected by mentally, physically, financially, unfortunately. But there was this moment, I remember the first weeks, We could go to nature physically, but can nature come to us? That's where I found that maybe using AI and beautiful nature photography, memories of humanity, and reconstruct this artwork. So imagine every single important national parks. Imagine every flower types, trees, lakes, oceans, mushrooms, <laughs> anything you can imagine in nature we download it and create an ai so and still then, now you are working with google for example 
Yeah, so I'm I'm constantly working. Um, it's Google. By the way, Google, Nvidia, Microsoft, IBM, Siemens. So I think the reason why this happened, I am very close to Silicon Valley. I was just the artist of the Silicon Valley, if it makes sense. Because before the museums, before the galleries, before the art world, last eight years, I'm practicing in Los Angeles, by the way. I'm teaching also at UCLA, uh, where I get my second MFA degree. And my focus, we open a studio. By the way, we are 15 people, can speak 15 language. And you have a I big administration. I can see to be able to speak to you, there are several layers. Huh? Because it's very important. It's not a one-man show. It is like Andy Warhol's factory, right? He has been working with incredible people or Jeff Koons working. I, but for me, we are just computer people. Like we love computation and imagination. Uh, yeah, but after all, why is data so important for art? I mean, uh -huh. there's Very data on one side and there's art and why to mix them? Because I think data is inevitably the most important, I think to me, memory for humanity. Because data is everywhere. Every single device, wherever we go, whatever we eat, whatever we read, watch, even go, right? Even machine says, go here, do that. Like we are in the mercy of machines and systems. And necessarily not everyone is aware of what data is still. Um, yes, some people are aware of data, but not the majority of the world. But also data is inspiring. First of all, data to me is not just numbers. Data is the form of memory. It's a memory and it can take any shape and any color. Yeah. And that inspired me. And how can I represent memory of humanity, collective memories that is not personal, that is not private, but everyone, I hope, enjoys. Space, nature, time, urban, architecture, culture, So I focus on these topics, by the way, in my practice. But uh, yeah, yeah, I also speak to Michelle Kuo from the MoMA. Yes. And uh. She said that in a way, when you did the project with the MoMA and they didn't buy anything, I was surprised. They didn't purchase any of your work. Because it was a collaboration. We yeah, sell together. I mean, normally when you work with an artist, you buy something or you show physically something and they did not. And um, so she I, I, said I think... that in a way you were working with the unconscious of the computer, of the data. Yes. So and, that's and, interesting but... to think that there could be an unconsciousness of the data. Absolutely. It's a great world. But by the way, MoMA collaboration is very different, right? MoMA gave the entire archive and we made artwork together and it's sold in NFT which turned into, and also, so Momo was the partner of the artwork, by the way. But they didn't buy an NFT, did they? Uh, they, they didn't buy, but they are already in the, they, they are the people part of the collection, if it makes sense. Because in smart contract, you write Momo, like it's, it's their piece, it's their data. Like so, it's not a classical. Did you, did you give them an NFT, for example? Of course, in their wallets, there is. Because mm -hmm. they, they are the creators of also the like coexist in the creation. So it's not like classically owning a piece in a museum. It's the co-creation of the work. Yeah, but you have physical work. I mean, what I saw in- Not yet, but, but not yet. MoMA is completely digital. There is no yes, physical piece. But you, you, you could have made, uh, from the data of the MoMA, you could have made a maker work. Yeah, so, so, so it's coming in November. It's a little early to say, but coming. Okay. So maybe, I don't know if she told you or not, but I mean, anyway, so this is what we are. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so this is the, what you are guessing. Oh, okay. the next this step. is the next step. So I was yeah, yeah, surprised. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not so wrong. But no, 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 no. You are exactly right. But while doing the NFT project, the idea was not me or MoMA is collecting the idea of giving the work to the public. Um, okay. So, but, the, but you're right. So, the, the, but, the, the physical work is coming now to the, now to the museum. Okay, and, and, and so um, my, my question also is that it looks like all the computer um, mind so look a bit the same, <laughs> meaning, meaning when you mix all this data, I, for mm -hmm. example, I saw the one you did uh, for Christie's that you sold for 1 million, right? 1.4. 
the the Dowdy. Okay, four four hundred is a lot anyway. <laughs> and so the one you sold at Christie's uh, was um, Dowdy. Yeah, but it looked a bit. It looked looked a bit like the one uh, at uh, in Florence, no, with the Renaissance. Yes, because first of all, the frame idea I think is very similar, right? The frame is my very signature, I guess, imagination. Let me explain you maybe because that's a really exciting um, project. So in almost uh, 2011, I did my very first uh, AI data sculpture. And the idea was putting a major frame around the building during the Istanbul Biennale. But it was too expensive. They said, like, you cannot put a frame like around the building. It's so expensive. But I say, like, but there are artists creating amazing works with large scale. Like, why I cannot put a frame around the building? And that rejection, because of financial reasons, became that I use that frame all the time in virtual, not physical. It's a virtual frame. But and so that you were invited by the Istanbul Biennale? Yes, 2011. Ah, okay. I did my I did my first data sculpture in public in 2011. Wow, okay. And that frame, the, the, the frame you see, white frame that looks like Florence or in Gaudi or in this new upcoming project, it's a very much this manifestation of like what happens if you see two dimensions, but it's beyond that. Like Trump Loi, right? Trump Loi is my very much, I love Trump Loi and I love it so meaningful that the world around us is always augmented by I don't know, what is real, right? In a world where machines can do anything that you cannot even distinguish what is real, I always find it very meaningful to, to imagine beyond the two dimensions. So that's why you see a frame. But inside the frame, there is Gaudi's, Casabatiov, Renaissance, nature, flowers. And so the nature one will be very different very from different. The, the Renaissance one in, very much. in Florence. And so do you control, do you control the, do you make an intervention, a real intervention aesthetically to obtain yes. some results? Yes, it's a very actually intense research because when you train an AI, it's not just a one click, not a one button. There is a lots of parameters, lots of. It takes weeks and months to like really craft the AI. And that's where I found my, thinking brush that is using this information. For example, in this, in this project, we have five chapters and each chapter will explore different natural phenomena. One chapter is about landscapes. Imagine these beautiful French landscapes, Alps and so on. One will be exploring the flowers, just beautiful flora systems. One will be exploring trees, the branch and like these you know, beautiful free hanging structures of life. One will explore clouds, just the clouds, beautiful blue and white. One will explore the water, the ocean, the lake. And so, how shall it be shown? Sorry? How shall it be shown? I mean, it will sometimes be, it, it's it, the cloud, sometimes it's water. Yes, there's a narrative. There's this narrative. People will be going through this 20 minutes long journey with the music. And the music is also AI. So we collect from the nature the bird songs, the water, the waterfalls, the rainforest. We collect amazing nature sounds to make the music. So it's also with AI. But uh, did you have music before? Yes. In my work, since the beginning, I work with an amazing composer, Kerim Karaoglu. He's from uh, Germany Folkfang Academy, an amazing uh, musician. Turkish. Work, Turkish, yeah, Turkish German. And he is working with me more than 11 years. Like a Hans Zimmer and Christopher Nolan, right? This cinema and like how the composer works. Because by the way, we also make tools for him. We, we create algorithms for him. He can play with, he can play AI. And I think it's a very emotional feeling that I think will trigger, I hope, a very beautiful effect. And an Yeah, mindless. but I could see that people are like hypnotized by uh, your work, huh? Thank you. Yes, I think I think there is this moment of connection. Like but what is your aim with your work? Many things. The first of all, I love public art. I, I'm coming from public art. I do believe art should be for anyone, 
any age, any background. Second, to make this happen, I am in this journey of finding the language of humanity. But this language is not the language we know, <laughs> the language of like perception. And the perception, I hope that nobody needs to know a language that is naturally from our DNA gene as a human, we can feel and connect it. And that's possible, I think, with algorithms, data and AI, when it's done ethically. Mm. And I think the other thing is I'm inspired, inspired inspiration. Like the world we are in, inspiration for young generations. There is a massive change in the tools and the field and the, and the computation. The world is changing so fast. And I think this, and, and it's time to like innovate in a way that art doesn't need to be anymore just a painting or sculpture. Art can also evolve. Art can also reconstruct itself and be responsive to the, what's going on in our society, in the world. So like I'm always up to date, try to be up to date, try to be ahead of actually time, work with cutting edge science, art and technology. And, and are you in the chronology of art? Where, where are you? I am a little bit far away. <laughs> Maybe not there. The, I may not be here, but in near future, just, just there, just, just, just around the corner. And I but you, are you interested by classic art? Of course. I respectfully, I have so much heroes, Light and Space Movement, James Turrell, Robert Irwin, Don Flavin. I research very closely like Da Vinci. I look at Monet, like Monet is one of my inspiration. I mean, when Monet inspires from the atmosphere, when he imagines beautiful, like, you know, sky, I don't think it's too different now when I think about dreaming all the national parks in the world. Now, I am not maybe dreaming here, but I am dreaming with a machine. Yes, because you say a sentence that no classic artists say, I love physical world, which means Absolutely. there's another world. Yeah, but Absolutely. to say there's a physical world means there's another world. What is the other world? Verse, metaverse, multiverse, a world that is existing right now in the computation, in the world. Like yeah, but in this world, there's so much junk. True. It's That's horrible. Not. The metaverse world is terrible, <laughs> full of junk and easy yeah. images. It's very boring in a way. Very true. I agree with you. That's why it's another challenge to shine in the world of darkness. But I think the artwork you will be seeing sold for $1.2 million as an NFT. So you will watch an experience that is different, I hope, than the majority of the pieces you mentioned. Yes. And it's an NFT, by the way. It's an NFT. The work is an NFT. It's an NFT with a physical option. Correct. So an it's experience a, in life. Yes. But <clears> it's, <throat> a, it's a digital, right? Do you use this word? Correct. That, that's also true. Yeah, yeah, people are using. But, but by the way, for me, metaverse is never just a cold, boring marketplace or a TV on our face. <laughs> you know, I never thought... For me, metaverse or NFT is when the physical and virtual connect. Like when they connect to me has a value. But NFT is not in us, right? One need to have a physical version. That's why it's pertinent, don't you think? Correct, but that's a very nice challenge for creators and artists, like how to achieve this portal from physical to virtual world. Transcend the mind with a powerful, an experience in life or provocation of the mind that is like reconstructing your wirings. And I know it will happen that people will even think like, is it real? Like, is it like a real piece? Is it look like, is it like a, is like a three dimension? By the way, this happened, the piece first shown in Koenig Gallery in Berlin, a version. And we had an incredible audience, 200,000 audience in four weeks. So it may be the largest audience in a gallery, not in a museum, but in a gallery. You like, you like figures. <laughs> because, because that's the data, that's the reaction. And that's what you can quantify. Yeah, but in a way, it, it's even, it fits even more the screens than the reality, your work. Absolutely. I think I, I love playing with reality, I can say. Manipulating the reality, being able to reconstruct it with art. So you have a lot of pressure now, no? Actually, I feel very confident, not a pressure. The pressure is almost about like 
being sure the world understands it. It's not the art. I'm very confident about the art. I know that it touches the mind and the soul. It it makes the 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 mind to 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 trigger, mm-hmm. has questions, impact. It's meaningful and purposeful. My con- my my concern is to be sure, the data and the AI can become the art world. This movement can become an art world, and yeah. that is. And for the first time now, there are things happening in the museum, in real museum. Which is very important to me. Have you That's seen the, that Beeple is showing in uh, in Torino? In uh, um, oh, the, the the one the one that is turning the, the returning piece. Yeah, yeah, yes. which is a digital too. That's Correct. Interesting. Are you interested? But w- what he does? Of course, Beeple and Puck, we are very good friends for more than ten years. Ah, that's interesting. We are very close friends. We are the generation doing this so long, actually. And uh, you, you are, you are discuss, discuss, you make, you have discussion about what you are doing and all that. Of course, all the time we are in connect. We are in the same symposiums. We are in the same discords. We are in the same. We are messaging each other every time. We have a big projects and so. The, so, so this is very normal because we are the. I think both me and people and Pak Murat Pak also. I would love to because Murat Pak is also a very interesting figure. While not maybe publicly a human face, but a being, right? Like I, I, I think I am the face of public art and experiential art. Where I take data AI, people is using pop culture, like in 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 his figurative work. So, so we have been doing this. I am 14 years. He is doing 15 years. I think now we are getting recognition of like what we have been trying to say. Mm-hmm. And and so, uh, what is the next step for you now? Again, museums are very important. This is a time to be more responsible. This is a time to like get beyond like what I could imagine. Um, I, I'm very excited because this recognition is very very important. Um, now working very hard for more than a decade with data and AI. Now I feel connected with the art world. Um, very close to working with Hans Ulrich Orbis for other projects. With MoMA. Yeah, uh, for the Serpentine. Yes, and for British Museum and many other museums also coming. Ah. So I'm happy to say So that. what are you doing for Serpentine now? Can you tell? Uh, in Zurich, we will be talking in a couple of weeks and we are working with a new initiative. Uh, we'll be working with ATH uh, Zurich. Mm-hmm. And then Hans Uri is one of the, uh, of course, uh, senior advisor and, and a helper. And I'll be creating a new artwork um, in collaboration with uh, Julius Ba, the, the bank. And they are like one of the um, facilitator. But to make art, to make to digital art for also in Metaverse. Ah, okay. But it's not for the Serpentine Gallery, right? Eventually, it will be. Uh-huh. So, but, but first creating in Zurich, we are focusing Zurich as a city. But Serpentine Gallery is the partner of the project that oh, is nice. initiating the entire process. Like, I think I gave more than 10 talks now with Hans Ulrich just one year about the, this movement and how, but, but there's one thing that I think very inspiring. The idea of NFT as a public art, NFT as an experiential art. Because if you look at my work, like how Kusama did the Infinity Rooms, right? Just in last, no, last October, I did a project called Machine Halogen Space. We made, we made the room itself NFT. The immersive room sold for $2.4 million in Sotheby's in Hong Kong. Ah, I didn't know that. Yes. So you have a, a higher price than the 1.4. But that was not, the, that was a room. It's an architectural room. You know, that's, okay. that's, one is a room, one is a sculpture. I think from there, there's, there are differences. But what I want to say is it is very much I can say last one year, my work recognized in Sotheby's and Christie's and now Pompidou's and Mets and MoMA. So I'm res- I'm done more excited than before because of this this of response. And but what do you think about the art market for NFT? I think, I think it's it is not everything is art. Not everything is art. And art is limited and art is not everywhere. And you are making art. How yes. do you know you are making art? It, the intent to me, art is humanity's capacity of imagination, and I'm using this capacity to the utmost I can. Um, and it's not a product or a service; it's an experience in life. So it's pretty clearly distinct, and what mm. it is. And, and do you think there will be an evolution in your art? Yes, 
aesthetically, I mean? Yes, because now I'm working with quantum computers. I'm working with brain signals. I'm working with heart. Like now I'm evolving into this new era of, oh, even I'm using with scent, the scent of AI. But so, you know, I was, I was seeing you drinking a latte, kind of. Yes. Latte. <laughs> And in, in fact, in your work, I saw this kind of substance. <laughs> Correct. By the way, I love water since my childhood. I think I'm in love with water and light. Like water is, I mean, we've made of water, right? Without water, we don't have a life. Without light, there is no life. I'm just in love with these fundamental materials in life. Yeah, but just... you are not made of latte, right? No. <laughs> so, but in your, in your, in your, in your work in uh, Florence, There's this kind of substance. We want ah. to drink it. Oh, they, so actually, it's super interesting. Renaissance era paintings. We, we got 12,000 Renaissance era paintings done between 1300 to 1700 years. And the color in the data, the overall pigmentation in 400 years is very much in on that color. So when you look at all that year from a perspective of like understanding, Like imagine your mind is learning all the paintings. The cumulative understanding of the color is something like that. It's very actually scientific. Like you mean uh, cafe latte color? Um, cafe latte color, I think, is the color of Renaissance. I'm saying <laughs> it's scientific. <laughs> yeah, or it became like that. I believe it is a. It's scientific. Mathematically, if you connect all these outputs of the creators painters and artists you'll find that common color yeah but the thing is that uh, at the beginning probably the colors were brighter no oh true and ai it, but that's why in the in renaissance dreams you see very white very pop very very bright colors and it goes through all these like color palettes all kind of forms of it and again it's an it's an It's an evolution of the thinking, humankind, and I think it reflects there. And you want motion in your work, right? All the time. Because for me, data is not a dry pigment. Data is in flux. Data is alive. Well, so let, let's wait for the next, what will be your next revolution? When shall it be? Next year? It's called Data Land. Data ah. Land is, is my imaginary metaverse museum. <laughs> let's call it like that and yeah. where, where, where shall we see it first los angeles and in everywhere in the world where in los angeles where uh, next to frank gary i can say next to frank gary is disney hall very close mm. another frank gary building i can say <laughs> inside inside the frank gary building i mean inside the, his building inside the concert hall No, no, very close. Another Frank Gehry building. There's another Frank Gehry building uh, next to it. He designed a new building opening next year. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Ah, yeah. you mean, uh, okay. So one opening next year. Yeah, so next year, now we are developing our own fantasy world where data becomes an experience. But why don't you want to say the name? Or the, or the building of the, the grand. The building is the grand, the, the, his new building. I mean, I wish I can show my screen, but I can say it's an it's, it's a next Frank Gehry building. And we are inside his new um, amazing building, which is called Data Land. It will be wow. the very first metaverse. It's the very first multi-sensory metaverse. Not pixels, not digital only. It's exactly where the physical and virtual worlds connects. Oh, my other next thing is well-being. Human mind. This artwork, this creation made an impact in the mind and the soul. And I am researching this. We are putting people in the, in the machines, the MRI machines, and looking like why this piece is this. You can talk forever with the books, but at the end, how do we quantify this? Like, can we really say scientifically this specific certain conditions makes you different? Is it possible? Because, again, art is incredibly exciting, but it's not always quantifying. It's not science. I mean, it's very spiritual, personal, intellectual, but doesn't mean like physics. You can talk about absolute reality or truth. It's too, it's too subjective. 
But mm-hmm. why the same thing could trigger the same subjective effects? Then it starts to become, wait, is it objective? <laughs> There's nothing objective, objective, no? Sorry? There's nothing objective. I think so too, you're right. But maybe scientific objective, like scientifically objective, let's call it. I mean, numerically, mathematically. And it was very interesting. Then I just like, can we measure this? Like, can we feel it? So I'm happy to say that this is our next journey, understanding the power of art and then make a really transcending. Okay, wow, what a program. Yeah. And can you imagine if one day I can say watching my work makes you better? <laughs> ah, is that, what, what you, is that what you would like? Ultimate dream to be helpful for humanity. Okay. I mean, if, if I only do just egocentric works that is only about my humble journey, it's not to me inspiring. But can if you I'm imagine not... if there's an evil artist who makes the same thing uh, like you, but want people to feel bad? <laughs> it can be. It can be. It's art. But my feeling is I find myself, I, I want to be meaningful and purposeful in life. I just don't want to be egocentric and showing something because of what it is. Mm. I don't feel a connection with that idea. I feel like I would like to be more functional for humanity. We have enough problems in the world and I want to bring beauty and aesthetics in the most positive way ever. We need that. Bon, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. I hope, I hope it was exciting. And-